So, my question is to get to introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, Julie Wilson. And first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about Julie. Julie loves the outdoors. And uh, Julie is an academic coordinator, a professional master of land and water systems at UBC. She is also a lecturer and uh, teaching courses in professional communications and urban watershed management and uh, services, major graduating projects. Julie received her uh, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science in 2007 and her Master's of Science in Research Management and Environmental Studies in 2011 from the University of British Columbia. She's a professional agrogeologist. Well, that's a tongue twister for sure. <laughs> Her uh, research interests involve the assessment of natural and man-made landscapes and how they affect the uh, quality and uh, quantity of freshwater resources. Julie's professional and research goals have evolved towards science outreach and communications, strengthening connections between the academic community and the public, policymakers, the private sector, youth, and more. Please join me in uh, welcoming Julie here today. Trees, vegetation, maybe some bare soil. 
And you can see that most, or 50% of the precipitation is probably going to infiltrate into the soil, might move as that interflow, that shallow horizontal flow, or it might flow deep into the groundwater. Only about 10% of it would exist as runoff, and the remainder would either be intercepted by the tree canopies and evaporated, or it might be transpired, so pulled up through the roots of the plants and uh, transpired back to the atmosphere. In urban environments, on the right-hand side, where we've built up various kinds of developments, we've disrupted these flow pathways. And this is primarily due to impervious surfaces preventing infiltration. Look at how much those infiltration numbers have dropped. And we see that that water is now moving as runoff. That's what we call stormwater. So how does this translate to stream health? This is just another theoretical system where we see what stream discharge, uh, how it responds after a precipitation event. This is shown for a forested or an uh, undeveloped watershed. If we add uh, the same kind of relationship now for an urbanized system, we can see that the relationship has changed. And I think Kim alluded to this, and you're probably all familiar with this, maybe even firsthand. I'll say that the scale has been exaggerated so you can visually see. But there's three main ways that uh, the flow pathways have changed. First is that the, the timing to the peak flow in a stream is much shorter. So the water is moving very quickly as runoff is being conveyed through our storm networks and it's being uh, discharged into streams. This is often what we call a flashy system. We also see an increase in the volume of peak flow. This means there's more high energy water. And this is where we can see flooding, bank erosion, scouring, and all of these impacts that we don't really want to see in our natural stream channels. Finally, we see reduced low flows, or sometimes called base flows. So long after precipitation has stopped, normally we would have uh, that stream flow replenished from that interflow, so that water slowly moving through the soil and discharging into the stream. Since we've paved over a lot of that soil, we're not getting that storage anymore. And so we see a drop in base flow. And here in the dry summer months, that's where we can see the creeks drying up. Um, and so there's a real concern about maintaining environmental flows for uh, the local uh, ecosystems. And so although the total amount of water over the course of the year might be the same, the balance is different. And we also know that there are water quality concerns associated with this. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few uh, pollutants of concern. Of course, metals, organic compounds, typically coming from uh, wear of vehicles, uh, leaks um, that are going to be washed off the roads typically and they go through the storm drains. There's also nutrient concerns, um, people who apply fertilizers to their, their lawns and gardens, those can also be washed down. Typically, our storm water is not treated and it just gets um, flushed straight into the system. And this uh, graph shows a sort of classic relationship that um, many research projects over many years have verified. This relationship between the percent impervious uh, area within a watershed and uh, various different indicators of aquatic health. So this is shown to the benthic index of biotic integrity. Um, any folks who have done uh, cabin surveys would be familiar with, with this. Um, but these are those organisms like insect larvae, which are the food base for fish and amphibians. You can see that typically as the watershed goes beyond 10 to 15 percent impervious, we're going to see a complete shift in the communities uh, in these streams. We're going to see lower status of stream health. We've lost some of the more sensitive community functional groups, and we're left with the more um, pollution tolerant or resilient species. So we really um, have changed our ecosystems. But we haven't traditionally managed stormwater with stream health in mind. So great infrastructure highlighted by some of these photos includes the conventional engineered piped drainage, which is designed to move runoff away from our properties, um, from valuable infrastructure as a flood protection and safety measure. So these storm sewer networks will concentrate flow and pollutants in a large flush of water, which can negatively impact the aquatic environment as we've seen. But how do we improve the situation? There are more innovative options that are supplied by what collectively can be called green infrastructure. So this reduces the amount of stormwater runoff, increasing the amount of retention and infiltration of rainwater on site, and in some cases can treat the water quality. Um, if it's allowed to move through the soil, microorganisms can break down a lot of these contaminants of concern. So these green infrastructure can address the low intensity, more frequent rainfall events, rather than the rare large events um, that 
gray infrastructure is designed. So green infrastructure can complement gray infrastructure, which is still needed for flood protection. And there are a wide range of different examples of designs. I'm sure many of you have seen them and are familiar with them. I'm just going to draw your attention to two that I'm going to talk about in my demonstration of the water balance model. On the top right, infiltration swales. These are shallow landscape areas that typically have a built-in storage component in a base layer, so underground, that consists of porous granular material that will quickly absorb water and slowly release it into the surrounding soil. Similarly, rain gardens, just to the left of it. They have typically a deep layer of topsoil. They're planted with vegetation that can usually do well under both wet and dry conditions. And again, they often have built-in storage underneath. And as a bonus, many of these green infrastructure designs add value and beauty to your property. So by incorporating green infrastructure, the goal is to make your property mimic the natural flow of water that's appropriate for the watershed in which you live. And as Kim um, described, so I'm just going to quickly touch on it again, it's those three flow pathways that have been disrupted that we're really focused on restoring. So with a few small adaptations to a property's design that serve to slow, sink, and spread the rainwater, the site can function as it did when it was undeveloped. And so why is this particularly important now? I will echo what Kim was saying before, that we are in the middle of a redevelopment wave here. Um, there was a grad student a few years ago um, who did an assessment of the neighborhoods in the Hoskins Creek watershed. Um, and I'll show a, a graph similar to what Kim showed. But really, what um, Daphne did was she looked at the um, characteristics of houses that underwent redevelopment. It's a bit difficult to see, but these are just aerial images of the same property in 2003 and then after redevelopment in 2009. And this is just a typical example of what happens. Um, the older house was torn down, a new larger house was built that's bigger and it has a larger driveway. So we're seeing an increase in impervious surfaces, no to little uh, green infrastructure being um, implemented. So we'll expect an increased volume of runoff generated from this site. And so this is the same graph. Knowing the age of houses, typically on the North Shore, most were built before 1975, and we're right in the middle of this redevelopment wave. We know that municipalities are all going towards increased densification. Multiple units are now being allowed on a single family property. I think the district just um, approved that. And so given that neighborhoods all across the North Shore are undergoing redevelopment, now's the time to see if considerations for mimicking that more natural water balance can be made. So we can use tools like the water balance model to better manage our rainwater. The express tool focuses on the site scale. Right here. So keeping rain on site. This tool helps to illustrate the linkages between your property and the local stream health and allows you to explore alternative green infrastructure designs that you could apply to your property to potentially improve the water balance. And with these site scale solutions, we can effectively manage about 75% of the precipitation that falls in the region. Again, those low uh, intensity light showers that we experience all the time. I'm surprised we're not today. Um, but the big goal is that if every property were able to manage all the rainwater that fell within its property lines during an average rainfall event, then this would help to restore the natural water balance of the region. And so in the model, watershed-specific targets have been developed and verified based on that water balance methodology that Kim talked about, that flow-duration relationship. All it means is that you're trying to find that sort of sweet spot where Stream erosion is not increased during the wet weather, so we're producing that flashiness, and those environmental flows are sustained in the summer during dry weather, so we're bringing up that base flow. So we're just trying to get that graph that I showed you back to the more natural graph. The targets also consider local um, environmental constraints. You might live in a watershed that has a very steep slope, or you might have really shallow soils to bed off, um, and so you have to think about the specific considerations, but the targets account for that, which is really nice. And I have to credit Kim for the development of the methodology as well as um, Jim Dumont, um, another engineer for the partnership, who's done some pretty fantastic um, work with developing these methods. 
Okay, so I'm going to switch over um, to my internet browser because I want to show you the tool.